early this Tuesday morning, the 11th of September, 2001. Al, it is such a pretty morning, it isn't is it? Perfect fall morning. On September 11th, 2001, the world changed. The land of the free has now become the land of the enslaved. The people of our once glorious United States have traded their liberty for security. But has it all happened by design? December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. Many questions linger about the events of that day, that day of infamy. But one thing we know for certain, the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor set in motion a course of events that would eventually lead us to a one-world government. Japan began this war in treachery. We shall end it in victory. In the aftermath of World War II, the United Nations was created, and the path toward a one-world government accelerated. Each war brings us one step closer to what the Bible calls the end of the world. Checkpoints are being set up everywhere. The police state is tightening its grip on the people of the United States. And to those who understand biblical prophecy, what comes next will not be a surprise. At some time in the future, the King James Bible states that everyone on the planet will be required to take a mark in order to buy or sell. As our current economic system collapses and as technology expands, cash is becoming a thing of the past. The reality of a cashless society is not far off. In fact, it's already being implemented. Despite denial by many religious leaders, evil men are working around the clock to bring in a new world order. We can see the end rapidly approaching and the stage being set for the emergence of the Antichrist. We can hear the voices of those who are subverting our U.S. Constitution and promoting this global government system. A new world order. And with all this right around the corner, this film is more important than ever. Satan is working behind the scenes to set up a one world government and a one world religion in preparation for the Antichrist. He has also deceived modern evangelical Christians into believing that they will be removed from this earth before the Great Tribulation takes place. This doctrine, known as the pre-tribulation rapture, teaches that Christ may return at any moment and that there will be no signs of his coming. As a result of this deception, most Christians are completely unprepared for what the Bible has warned us is coming. Although the scriptures clearly state in Matthew 24 and elsewhere that the rapture will take place after the tribulation, big name preachers, Bible colleges, and popular films such as Left Behind have taught the masses to expect that the rapture may occur at any moment. And because most Christians have never read the entire Bible for themselves, few are aware that the pre-trib rapture is a fraud not found in scripture. But if the pre-tribulation rapture is not found in the scripture, where did it come from? My name is Steven Anderson. I'm the pastor of Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. And I'm on a mission to educate people about the pre-tribulation rapture because it's a position that's based upon ignorance. And I just believe that if people would see the scriptures and see the facts, it wouldn't be hard for them to come to the conclusion that the rapture definitely comes after the tribulation. My name is Roger Jimenez. I'm the pastor at Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento, California. I grew up in a Christian home and I was taught the pre-tribulation rapture my whole life and I never had a reason to question it. Preachers told us that and I just took it for what it was worth. But as I was exposed to that doctrine, I began to see just how unscriptural it really is and I just feel that we need to teach the Bible and get the truth out there. The pre-tribulation rapture doctrine is pretty new. There's no evidence of anyone teaching it before 1830. We've got to understand that the 1830s is pretty late in history. I mean, for thousands of years from the time of Christ, we went through the Reformation, we went through all sorts of 
theologians, you know, whatever you, you do or don't agree with men like Martin Luther or John Calvin or whatever it is, the fact is that thousands of books, thousands of papers, thousands of essays, and uh, a whole lot of preaching had been done before 1830. And I'm talking, there's no evidence of anyone from any denomination, any type of Christianity that taught this doctrine. When you look at the historical account, you've, you've got to ask yourself the question, what are the roots of the pre-tribulation rapture? One of the early proponents of pre-tribulationism was a man by the name of John Nelson Darby. In the 1830s, he began to teach the doctrine of what he called the secret rapture. He would later produce his own translation of the Bible, from which he removed entire verses, corrupted important biblical doctrines, and tampered with key passages concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. John Nelson Darby, known as the father of modern dispensationalism, promoted his theory of a pre-tribulation rapture throughout the 19th century. Later, the pre-tribulation rapture gained widespread acceptance among Baptists when Oxford University Press published the Schofield Reference Bible, which contained marginal notes promoting the concept of Darby's secret rapture. These notes have caused many Christians to embrace this doctrine as though God had said it himself. The devil has used this tool of the Schofield reference system of the Bible more than anything to promote this doctrine of the pre-trib rapture. You want to know where it comes from? This is how it got into churches. This is where pastors are getting it. This is where it's coming. It ain't coming from the Bible. It sure didn't come from the mouth of Jesus Christ, but it came from the mouth of Schofield. And so Schofield's notes point to a pre-tribulation rapture and they lead the reader to believe that it's in scripture when it's really not there at all. And so because of the Schofield Bible being sent out to so many seminaries and colleges and, and so many young preacher boys reading the Schofield Reference Bible, they started to just take the pre-tribulation rapture as fact and started preaching it. Fictionalizations about the imminent rapture also reached the 70s generation through the films of Don Thompson. Suddenly and without warning, literally thousands, perhaps millions of people just disappeared. A few eyewitness accounts of these disappearances have not been clear, but one thing is certainly sure. Millions who were living on this earth last night are not here this morning. Thompson's trilogy of thrillers played a significant role in indoctrinating a new generation of teens. Since its premiere, more than 300 million have seen A Thief in the Night. In 1995, Tim Dale House published Tim LaHaye's and Jerry Jenkins' apocalyptic novel, Left Behind. And this is a fictional series that depicts everybody disappearing and nobody knows where they are. Cars are crashing into each other, airplanes are crashing because the pilot's gone. And this dramatic presentation of the pre-tribulation rapture has become a part of the American culture and, and people just accept it to be true. And uh, it's a stupid movie. Left Behind would go on to sell 63 million copies worldwide, spawn a series of 16 books, as well as three movie adaptations to date. But Left Behind is a work of fiction. To learn the truth about the rapture, we must look within the pages of the Bible itself. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the key rapture passage. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we find probably the most famous text in regards to the rapture. Anyone would agree that this passage is talking about the rapture. This is the most clear teaching in the Bible about Jesus coming in the clouds and us being caught up together to meet him. The Bible reads in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. So what he's saying here is that he doesn't want them to be ignorant about Christians, believers who have died, those who are asleep in Jesus, those who've already gone on to be with the Lord. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this, brethren, because I don't want you to mourn like those who have no hope. I want you to know that you're going to see your loved one again that was a saved person. You're going to see them once again because the Bible says that when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to bring them with him. The dead in Christ shall rise first and so forth. That's why he said in verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. That's why this is a really popular passage you'll hear at funerals. I've been to a lot of funerals 
where people comfort one another with these words. So notice every single verse, he's bringing up the fact that we're going to see these people again who've passed on. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or come before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So if you get the context, the comfort is that you're going to see your loved ones again. He says you will see them again because if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, in the same way he's saying, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. They're going to be resurrected. The dead in Christ shall rise first. He says comfort one another with these words. There's no comfort here mentioned. You're going to escape persecution. You're not going to be persecuted. You're not going to go through tribulation. You're not going to go through affliction. You're not going to suffer. Does this passage even mention the tribulation? No. Was anything about the tribulation mentioned? No. He didn't say comfort one another that you're never going to go through tribulation. Comfort one another that you're not going to be persecuted. Comfort one another that there's a pre-tribulation rapture. That's not what he's saying. Now, when we look at this passage, there are a few characteristics we can see about the rapture, and, and it will help us identify the rapture in other passages. I'd like you to understand what the rapture consists of. If you look at verse number 16 there, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. So the first thing that we got to understand about the rapture is that the Lord is coming down from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel, and I want you to make note of this, and with the trump of God. That's the second characteristic I'd like you to see about the rapture. So we're going to have the Lord descend. We're going to have the trump of God. And then the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be, make note of these words, caught up together with him in the clouds. So when the rapture happens, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the characteristics of the rapture are the fact that the Lord's going to descend, the fact that we're going to hear a trumpet sound, and the fact that we will be caught up together to meet him in the clouds. Go back to Matthew 24 and see the exact same elements in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Look at Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. And sometimes I want to just ask people, what part of after do you not understand about this passage? But it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man. The Son of Man was something that Jesus called himself while he was on this earth. He said, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. All the same elements. Jesus is coming in the clouds. A trumpet sounds. He sends the angels to gather his elect. The reason I showed you this, because I want you to understand, in Matthew 24, verse 30 and verse 31, we see the rapture. And when we compare it to 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 and 17, it matches up perfectly. Keep your finger there and just go to Mark 13. Now, Mark 13 pretty much says all the same things that Matthew 24 says. It's, a, it's what the, we would call a parallel passage. You find the same preaching, the same teaching in these two chapters. Uh, you could put them side by side. They say the same things. Uh, let me just show it to you in that passage. It says in verse 24, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now, at this point, we could just pray and go home. We should just be able to just close our Bible and say, there you have it, folks. It's after the tribulation. Just close our Bibles and go home. But oh no, we're not going to close our Bibles and go home. Amen. Because I'm going to prove to you and, and show you this is talking about the rapture, and this says it's after the tribulation. A lot of people will attack this chapter and say this. 
you can't get your doctrine on this from Matthew 24 because Matthew 24 is only talking to the Jews. They'll just write this passage off and say, oh, this is only for the Jews. And some scholar somewhere decided that the book of Matthew is to the Jews, the book of Mark is to the Romans, the book of Luke is to the Greeks, and the book of John is to the world. Oh, thank you, God, for including us in at least one of the four Gospels. But who comes up with this stuff? Now look, maybe Matthew is geared toward the Jews. Maybe Luke is geared toward the Greeks. Maybe the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians was geared toward the Ephesians. Do you think? Maybe the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews was geared toward the Hebrews. Maybe the epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians was geared toward the Thessalonians, but every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. The book of Titus wasn't just for Titus. That was a short-lived book. It's for every pastor to read. It's for every believer to read. It's, it's the New Testament. But here's what they say, no, 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 Pastor Anderson, you don't get it. This whole sermon was preached about the Jews to the Jews for the Jews. Jesus Christ, they say, was preaching to the Jews in the Olivet Discourse. That's the fancy theological name they gave to this passage. Matthew 24, Mark 13, they call it the Olivet Discourse. Pastor Anderson, he was talking to the Jews. Don't you get it? When he said in Mark 13, 24, after the tribulation, after that tribulation, and then he talked about Jesus coming in the clouds in verse 26 and gathering the elect in verse 27 from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. He said, they say, that's just talking to the Jews only. Okay, look at the last verse of Mark 13. Mark 13, 37. And what I say unto you, I'm only saying to the Jews. Don't let any preacher try to tell you this is for all believers. It's only for the Jews. Is that what it says in Mark 13, 37? No, it says, and what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. That's the last word of the chapter. What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. And yet people will still turn around and say, this chapter is not talking to all. It's only talking to the Jews. It's almost like he knew that people would say that. And so he just says it at the end. I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to all when I say watch. This is for everybody. And so to say that this chapter is only talking to the Jews is ridiculous when he flat out says, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Oftentimes people will look at Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31, and they'll say, well, even though it looks like the rapture, and even though it sounds like the rapture, it's not the rapture. And here's the reason they'll say it's not the rapture. If you look at verse 31, it says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. And people will look at that word and they'll say, well, see there, the word elect is not Christians. They'll say the elect is Israel. So therefore, Matthew 24 is not the rapture, is not meant for Christians. This whole chapter is meant for the Jews because he's talking about the elect. But he, the issue with that is this. We must always allow the Bible to be its own dictionary. I've got a list here of every time the word elect's used. We're not going to go through it because we don't have time. But I could go through every time elect's used and I could show you that every single time it's talking about people that are saved. The reason people believe that the word elect is talking about Jews or talking about Israel is because instead of studying the Bible and instead of reading the Bible, they've been reading commentaries and they've been reading books written by men and those men have told them what the definition of words are. The Schofield Reference Bible has a note in Matthew 24 where it says that the word elect is referring to Israel. But the Bible defines itself and the Bible gives us the answer to all the questions of doctrines we have. And the word elect, if you study it out in the Bible, simply is not the Jew. Uh, just to give you a quick highlight, in 1 Thessalonians 1.4, it says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, talking to the Thessalonians who are clearly Gentiles, we saw it in Romans 8. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justified. Out of 16 mentions of the term elect in the Bible, I found 10 re refer to all believers in general. Two of them refer to believers who are specifically Gentiles. One of them refers to believers who are Jews. Two of them refer to Jesus Christ himself. And one refers to Jacob the person as being God's elect. I'll give you one verse that just clearly shows you that the elect does not mean Israel. Because people say the elect, that's Israel, that's the Jews. Okay, Romans 11, 7. It says, what then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So the Bible says, Israel has not, the election has. Well, if Israel were the election, that wouldn't make any sense. 
And see, throughout Scripture, it's very clear, if you allow the Bible to define itself, that the elect are not the Jews, that the elect is not the nation of Israel, the elect are believers, they can be from Asia Minor, they can be Greek, they can be barbarians, they can be whatever. Hey, if you've put on Christ, if you put on the new man, you're considered the elect. So when we go back to Matthew 24, and he says, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, they shall gather together his elect, that goes perfectly with the passage in regards to the fact that it is the rapture of believers. It has nothing to do with whether they're a Jew or a Gentile, black, white, it's elect, it's those that are saved. He's going to gather them up in the clouds with him. Now, isn't that completely consistent with what it said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when it said there's going to be a trumpet, going to be the believers, going to be caught up to be with Christ? A little later on in the same chapter, he says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. So nobody knows the day or the hour when this is going to happen. I can't tell you this is going to happen on October so-and-so of this year. And also later on, he says, then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. So God's telling us we don't know when it's going to be. It's something to watch for. We don't know the day or the hour. But he does tell us that it's after the tribulation. Because he said after the tribulation, the sun and moon are darkened. Then Jesus Christ comes in the clouds. That's when the trumpet sounds. That's when the believers are caught up. So just because we don't know the day or the hour doesn't mean that this is something that could happen at any moment. A lot of people will look at that, no man knoweth the day or the hour, and say it can happen at any moment. We just finished saying it's after the tribulation. Okay. And this is actually found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew covers it in, in Matthew 24. Mark covers it in chapter 13. Luke covers it in chapter 17 and chapter 21. And then John covers it in the book of Revelation. It's covered from all four. First comes the tribulation, then the sun and moon are darkened, then Jesus comes in the clouds for the rapture. Okay. The reason why people think that the rapture is before the tribulation is because they confuse the tribulation with God's wrath. Now, one thing to prove that God's wrath and the tribulation are two completely different things is that in Matthew 24, 29, it says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon shall not give her light. So the Bible's real clear in Matthew 24 that the sun and moon are darkened after the tribulation. Well, then if you go to Revelation 6, where you read about when the sun and moon are darkened, when the sixth seal is opened, it says, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood, exactly what it said in Matthew 24. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bond man, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So, according to this, when does God's wrath begin to be poured out? When the sun and moon are darkened is when they say, the great day of his wrath is come. Present tense is come, meaning that it just came. So, if Matthew 24 says that the sun and moon are darkened after the tribulation, and if God's wrath doesn't start until after the sun and moon are darkened, how can they be the same thing? So the wrath doesn't begin until after the sun and moon are darkened. And usually when you try to ask people to show you scripture on the pre-tribulation rapture, they can't show you any verse. And I'll challenge anybody to show me one verse that actually uses the word tribulation in it to support their pre-tribulation rapture position. They can't do it. They have to show you verses that use the word wrath. They'll find verses showing that we as Christians are not under God's wrath. And they'll show verses that say that we're not appointed to wrath and that we are saved from wrath. And they'll say, see right there, the Bible says we're not going to go through the tribulation. But wait a minute, tribulation and wrath are two different things. And so there is no verse that any pre-trib believer can show you that uses the word tribulation in it to prove their doctrine they'll take you to some verse about God's wrath. Well, God's wrath and the tribulation are two totally different things. Most Christians are taught in their churches and by the books that they read that these two things are the same thing. And when you try to tell them, hey, we're going to be here for the tribulation. The rapture doesn't come till after the tribulation. Here's what they're trying to tell you. No, God wouldn't pour out his wrath on his own people. 
We're not appointed to wrath. We're going to be spared from his wrath. But wait a minute. Is God's wrath the same as the tribulation? No. And so we, if we could just get people to understand what the word tribulation means, they would understand that the rapture comes after the tribulation. It's just that people don't understand the word tribulation because they've got this idea in their head that the tribulation is a seven-year period where God's pouring out his wrath and pouring out fire and brimstone, turning water into blood and, and tormenting people with scorpions and all these different plagues. That is not what the tribulation is. That's not what the Bible teaches. Now, those who believe in this so-called pre-trib rapture or a rapture that comes before the tribulation that can happen at any moment, let's break down that term, pre-trib rapture. Okay, it's got three elements to it, right? Pre means what? Before. Before. Trib, what's trib stand for? Tribulation. Tribulation. And then you've got rapture. Well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. The concept of the rapture is in the Bible because we see Jesus come in the clouds, people are caught up together with them in the air and so forth. So the concept of the rapture is there. The word rapture is not used. Is the word tribulation in the Bible? If you look up every single verse that uses the word tribulation, it's used 22 times in the New Testament. So if the New Testament uses the term tribulation 22 times and everybody's going around with this doctrine called the pre-trib rapture, shouldn't one of those 22 verses or 22 passages or chapters teach us something about a rapture happening before the tribulation? None of those times says anything about there being a rapture before the tribulation or anything like that. So the pre-tribulation rapture people have to rely on a lot of interpretation. They got to explain it to you. It's always really complicated. And I've noticed something about the Bible. God wants us to understand the Bible. He's not trying to play tricks on us and confuse us and make things difficult. He wants us to know the truth. He loves us. Okay. And so I've noticed that a lot of times the first time the Bible brings something up, he defines it for us and he helps us understand it. That way, when we see it the second time, we'll know what he was talking about. The Bible reads in Matthew 13, 21, Yet hath he not rooted himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he's offended. What do you see the definition of tribulation as? Persecution. He says tribulation or persecution that arises because of the word. So are these people going through tribulation because they're so bad? No, they're going through tribulation because they're standing on the word of God. And because they have taken a stand for the word of God, because they have received the word of God with all gladness, they're going to go through persecution or tribulation. If we're rooted and grounded in what we believe, when persecution and tribulation comes, we're going to endure. So the first time you see the word tribulation used in the Bible, it's coupled with persecution. And that's the first time the word tribulation is used in the New Testament. Well, if you follow every single time through the New Testament that the word tribulation is used, 90% of the time, it's talking about believers going through tribulation, saved people going through tribulation. And the other two times it's used where it's not talking about saved people, it has nothing to do with the end times prophecies. It's just talking about people going through tribulation in general. Christians throughout history have gone through tribulation. And our generation is not going to be any different. Maybe this will happen in our lifetime, maybe it won't. But if it happens in our lifetime, we're going to go through it as believers. We're either going to be killed for the cause of Christ, or hopefully we can, we can make it through this period and uh, make it to the rapture. The fifth mention of the word tribulation in the New Testament is found in John 16, 33. These things I've spoken unto you, he's speaking to believers, he's speaking to his disciples. He says, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Did he say you're going to avoid the tribulation? No. Did he say you're not going to go through tribulation? Did he say, I'd never let my people go through tribulation. I love them too much. No. What did the first mention of tribulation say in Matthew 13? That if people weren't rooted and grounded and persecution or tribulation would arise because of the word, they would be what? offended. Look what Jesus said in this chapter that warns us of tribulation in verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be what? Offended. offended. He says, if I don't tell you about this, if I don't warn you about the coming persecutions and tribulations and trials that you're going to go through in your life, when they come, you're going to be taken by surprise. You're going to be offended. You say, why are you preaching this sermon, Pastor Anderson? 
I'm preaching this sermon that you might not be offended. You say, wait a minute, this sermon offends. No, this is the sermon to stop you from being offended. Because Jesus said, if you know this is coming, you won't be offended. Look at verse 4. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. So he says there, when these things happen, you'll remember, I told you so. And I'm saying the same thing tonight that Jesus said. When these things begin to happen, and you know what? It may not be in our lifetime. Maybe it'll be 100 years from now. Maybe it'll be a couple years from now. We don't know when the end's going to be. But you know what? When it happens, you'll remember that I told you. And, you, and more important than that, because I didn't make this stuff up, You'll remember that Jesus told you. The next time you find the word tribulation is in Acts 14.22. And it says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. It's interesting the statement that is made. It says that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. A very specific statement in the Bible that when we enter into the kingdom of God, it'll be through tribulation, not that we're going to enter the kingdom of God before tribulation. Did he say, man, alive, it's great that we're going to be gone before the tribulation? No, he said, you better confirm them. You better firm them up on some things. You better strengthen them because they better know that they must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Any pre-tribulation rapture in mention number six? I didn't think so. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 4, the Bible says, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. He didn't say I'm exceeding joyful because I'm not going through tribulation. Man, I'm so joyful that we're going to be raptured before the tribulation. That's not what he said. He said, I'm exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Where is the pre-trib rapture in that scripture? It isn't there. It's just amazing to me that as you look at the word tribulation throughout scripture, you keep finding multiple references of believers saying, we're going through tribulation. He says, in all our tribulation. It's not something that believers don't go through. It's something that believers have been going through their whole lives. Throughout the generations, believers have gone through tribulation. And, and keep in mind, folks, God's not out to confuse us. He's not trying to mess with us. Man has been messing with you. Preachers have been messing with you. TV shows and movies have been messing with you with Left Behind and all this stuff. God's not messing with you. If we allow the Bible to be our dictionary and we allow the Bible to define words for us, we would find that the word tribulation is not the wrath of God. It is persecution. It is affliction. It is trouble. You'd think that somebody could show you one verse of those 22, out of the 22 mentions of tribulation, Show me one verse that says we're going to be gone before the tribulation or we're going to be caught up before the tribulation or the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation. Yet I can show you where the Bible point blank says immediately after the tribulation, Jesus is coming in the clouds, the trumpet's going to sound, and the elect will be caught up together with him in the clouds. It's that simple. And so those who believe in the pre-trib rapture, they just have to rely on people with their elaborate interpretations and logic and well, since we don't know the day or the hour, I guess that means it can happen at any time. And if it can happen at any time, it must be before the tribulation. Or they'll have some kind of a complicated chart that they can use to explain it to you. But if you just pick up the Bible and take it at face value, read the New Testament, start in Matthew chapter 1. When you get to chapter 24, there it is, clear as day. After the tribulation, Jesus comes in the clouds. Dr. Kent Hovind is a really famous evangelist who believed and preached the pre-trib rapture for 38 years. Well, now he's in prison. And since he's been in prison, he's been reading his Bible. And he realizes that the pre-trib rapture is not found in Scripture. And I want to give him a call and find out more about what made him switch. What made him realize that it's after the tribulation. Well, my name is Ken Hovind. I was a high school science teacher 15 years and then became an evangelist for 20 years teaching on creation and evolution. And then I've been really concerned about my view of the end times and how it fit together with Scripture. And I became convinced, oh, about three years ago, that what I'd been taught all my life is not true. I have had to switch, much to the dismay of many of my uh, fundamental brethren, to the ocean trip pre wrath position. The Bible says the scoffers in the last days would be willingly ignorant of the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment. 
Well, I spent 20 years teaching all over the world about the creation and the flood, but I kind of avoided the coming judgment part because I didn't understand it myself. The book of Matthew, chapter 24, Jesus' sermon, which gives, you know, the disciples ask you very clearly, okay, what's going to happen? What's the sign of your coming? And when is it going to happen? They ask you, you know, the same story is told again in Mark, chapter 13, and Luke, chapter 21. So I copied uh, pages from the Bible of all three of those passages and put them side by side to make parallel counts and went through and picked out all the details. And it just became more and more clear that the pre-trib rapture idea just was not true. Why do you think so many people believe in the pre-trib rapture? Why is this doctrine so popular? Well, it, because it, it answers an embarrassing problem. The Christians couldn't answer the questions about the dinosaurs. Where did they fit? So they made up the gap theory and fell for it. I think the idea that uh, this pre-trib rapture fits into that type of category where people are looking, have itching ears. This is what they want to hear. Right. Okay. They want to hear, hey, I won't have to endure suffering. Well, Jesus said there's coming a time of tribulation such as was not since the world began. I mean, do you think the Spanish Inquisition was bad or the Nazi Holocaust with the Jews was bad or the Roman persecution of the Christians? it's going to be worse than all of those put together. Wow, that's amazing. So the world starts off with Cain killing Abel, the bad guys killing the good guys. Right. It's been that way all through history. And Jesus told us, you know, when they kill you or when they persecute you, rejoice because your rewards are great in the kingdom of heaven. Well, and if we if we really take a biblical definition of what tribulation means, you know, not what it's been corrupted into meaning, if we actually take the biblical definition of the tribulation, wouldn't you say that you're going through tribulation right now? Oh, yes. Tribulation is what the world does to us. That right. has already happened for thousands of years. And Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be a good cheer, I've overcome the world. So Christians should expect tribulation, and we get great rewards if we go through it patiently. Now, since this class is about religious extremism, this might fall under that category in some people's minds, to think that there literally is going to be an end to this world, that there's going to be a literal, bodily second coming of Jesus Christ. And so that's what I want to just explain to you um, in a nutshell. I want to just give you just a brief timeline of what is going to take place according to the Bible and how this is all going to happen. I think the key to understanding the book of Revelation is understanding how it breaks down. God gave us the book of Revelation to be just that, a revelation, to reveal these things to us, not to hide them. It's not the book of camouflage. You know, it's the book of Revelation. And God wants it to be easily understood. And that's why he gave it to us in a format that's easy to understand. When you start reading in chapter one, you're at the time of Christ or, or thereabouts because John is on the Isle of Patmos and John has been persecuted for preaching the gospel. So we're talking about less than a century after Christ's coming to this earth. And then he re receives a vision where he sees the Lord Jesus Christ who appears unto him. And then in chapters two and three, Jesus Christ gives a message unto these seven churches of Asia. And obviously those are churches that were in, you know, the first century AD at that time. And then in chapters four and five, we see the vision up in heaven where it just kind of describes events going on in heaven. And then in chapter six, we get into the events of the tribulation. Chapter seven is where the great multitude appears in heaven. Obviously the rapture, all nations, all kindreds are represented there. Then in chapters eight and nine, you have God pouring out his wrath upon this earth. And then chapter 10 is kind of a parenthetical chapter talking about some things before the last trumpet sounds. And then in chapter 11, we have the seventh trumpet sounding. So all that to say this, if you look at the book of Revelation, the first 11 chapters, they follow a chronology that makes perfect sense. You know, you start out around the time of Christ as, as far as the same century as Christ, okay? Then you get into the events of the future, the tribulation, then the rapture, then God pouring out his wrath. And then when that seventh trumpet sounds in chapter 11, there's kind of a finality where he says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. But what's interesting is when you get to the end of chapter 11 and you have that finality at the end, well, then you get into chapter 12 and there's a major gear change in the book of Revelation here. Because look at verse number one of chapter 12 that we just looked at. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, 
and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now pay close attention to verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now, obviously, that child is Jesus Christ, because in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible talks about Jesus Christ ruling this earth with a rod of iron, and it's referring to his millennial reign of that's coming in the future. So really, the best way that I could help you understand the book of Revelation is just to tell you, just cut it in half, right at chapter 11, 1 through 11 on one half, 12 through 22 as the other half. And then if you put those halves side by side, you'll see the same events from two different angles. You say, why would God do that? Why would God tell the same story twice in the book of Revelation? Well, why did he tell us the gospel story four times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Why did he give us the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, but then he also gave us 1st and 2nd Chronicles to give us another angle, another perspective. And we can learn a lot from comparing the book of the Kings with the books of the Chronicles or comparing Matthew to Mark and Mark to Luke and Luke to John. And these give us different perspectives. Well, that's the same way that we understand the book of Revelation. That'll help you understand the book of Revelation when you understand that chronology. Now, some people think Revelation's not in chronological order at all, but the word after this, the term after this, or the term after these things occurs 10 times in the book of Revelation. And so if we see over and over again, after this, after these things, God's giving us an order of events here. You know, it's just, it's a ridiculous way to try to interpret the Bible or read the Bible to negate the fact that when the Bible says after this, you know, people say, well, it's not in chronological order. Um, it doesn't make sense. You know, I mean, all throughout the Bible, that's how you read scripture. A funny example in John 3, 21, it says, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Verse 22 says, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And it'd be ridiculous for me to stand here and say, well, no, verse 22 actually took place before verse 21, when verse 22 says, after these things. Now, we would look at that and think, well, of course, that's how it's written, that's what it means. But then we get to the book of Revelation, and like I said, 10 times you read the words, after this, after these things, but people say, no, it's not in chronological order, it doesn't make sense. It's just a, a dumb way of reading the Bible. And so if you get the idea that it's chronological, but it starts over again in chapter 12, that'll help you understand. And so I wanna just go through just a couple of chapters here and show you the order of events of the end times. This could happen 100 years from now, we might all be gone. But I think it's very likely that it will happen in the near future. In fact, I would be shocked if these things did not happen at least in my lifetime, if I live out my normal lifespan. You know, I'm 31 years old and at the speed which things are going right now, I'd be surprised if this doesn't happen in the next 40 years. And when I start to get into the message tonight, I think you'll understand a little bit why I say that, okay? Here's what starts out first, the tribulation. The Bible says that the devil, or Satan, okay, will be cast out of heaven. Now you say, wait a minute, Pastor Anderson, hadn't that already happened? But the answer is no. Most people think that the devil's in hell right now, but in reality, the devil has never even been to hell because the Bible makes it very clear that the devil is on this earth, walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the devil and all his demons are present upon this earth, according to the Bible. And he goes back and forth between earth and heaven, and he talks to God, and the, you know, if you read the book of Job, the devil comes and stands before God and has a conversation with God in heaven about his servant Job, you remember that? So, the devil right now goes back and forth. Well, the Bible talks about how someday the devil will be cast down from heaven and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth 
and his angels were cast out with them. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So what do we see here? There's war in heaven, and the Bible teaches that the devil loses this battle. He loses this war in heaven. And because he loses the battle, he and his angels, which here it shows it's one third of the angels, they are cast down unto the earth. Basically, this is Satan being cast out of heaven, and he knows he only has a little bit of time, and he will go out to persecute the believers and persecute the saints and try to destroy them. Look at chapter 13. Here's where that war begins, right? Because in verse 17, he's going out to make war. How's he going to do it? How is the devil going to make war with the believers? The next thing that we're going to see happen prophetically is what's called the tribulation. And the tribulation is a period where uh, there are going to be a lot of things happening upon this earth that are catastrophic. There are going to be famines. There are going to be pestilences. There's going to be warfare, like an extreme amount of warfare. A lot of people are going to be starving to death, dying of disease. A lot of horrible things are going to be happening. Well, out of all this warfare and, and cataclysm that's going to be taking place during the tribulation, not supernatural cataclysm, not God raining fire and brimstone, but rather uh, natural disasters, warfare, famine caused by human beings, there's going to be a man that's going to emerge and become a dictator of the entire world known as the Antichrist. This isn't a fairy tale. This is really going to happen. And in fact, we can already see the signs that it's beginning to happen. The Bible tells us that someday there will be a one world government. Right now, we have all these different governments, right? We got the United States, we've got Russia, we've got China. They're all separate sovereign nations. You probably heard the term sovereign. All these separate nations. Well, one day the Bible says all of those nations will unite together and form a one world government. And then once they form that one world government, they will hand all the power to one person that will be the head of that government. And that person is known in the Bible as the Antichrist. Who's ever heard of the Antichrist before? Yeah, everybody's heard that term, right? You know, the Antichrist is a biblical term. You know, you'll often hear the Bible talk about the beast or the beast from the sea or the beast with seven heads and ten horns. And they'll talk about the man of sin, the, the son of perdition. But the Bible also uses the term Antichrist. And I like to use the term Antichrist. It's a term that people understand, and it's a biblical term. I want to show you where the Bible mentions the term Antichrist, because the Bible tells us there is a person coming someday that's called the Antichrist. Before Jesus Christ comes back, there will be a decoy, a fake Christ. Do you see what I mean? The Antichrist is a guy who comes claiming to be the second coming of Christ, but he's an imposter. But since Christians now are being taught to expect Jesus to come back at any moment, perfect because guess who's really showing up the antichrist why does the bible call it antichrist because there's a man coming called the antichrist singular who's going to say that he's jesus christ and when that antichrist shows up in the tribulation and says i'm jesus christ they're going to accept him as their messiah a lot of people will teach oh when jesus christ comes in the clouds the jews will finally realize that he was their messiah and they'll accept him no, they'll accept the Antichrist. That's what the Bible says. When Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name and you receive me not, another will come in his own name, him you will receive. I think Satan's plan with the pre-tribulation rapture is to get everybody to have this mentality that Jesus Christ is coming at any moment. We're expecting the second coming of Christ at any moment. He could come today, he's coming today but really the person who's coming is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist, when he comes, he will be the head of a one world government and a one world religion where he basically claims to be the Messiah. 
It says in verse 18 of 1 John 2, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Now, is that singular or plural? So they've heard that Antichrist singular shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So there's one Antichrist coming, is there not? But aren't there many Antichrists even right now? That's what the verse says. Who are these Antichrists? Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. In order to believe that Jesus is not the Christ, you have to believe that there is a Christ and that it's not Jesus. The word Christ means Messiah. The Bible says in John chapter 1, we found the Messiah, which is to say being interpreted the Christ. So the Bible defines the word Christ as Messiah. The two are interchangeable. So let me ask you this. Can you think of a religion out there that says there's a Messiah coming, but it's not Jesus. Jesus wasn't him. The Jewish religion teaches there's a Messiah, all right, but it wasn't Jesus. They're still waiting for the Messiah. They say Jesus was not the Messiah. They're still waiting for the Messiah. The Bible says that they will basically receive the Antichrist as their Messiah. Evangelical Christianity that believes that Jesus can come back at any moment those that are not saved, those who don't really believe the truth, you know, many of them will be deceived and think, this is the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Muslims today, did you know that they are waiting for a great prophet and a great Messiah to come that's actually greater than Muhammad? President Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, who's ever heard of him before? President Ahmadinejad, he spoke to the United Nations General Assembly uh, a year or two ago and when he did, he gave a brief synopsis of Islam. The essence of the message of prophets is one and the same. Every messenger has endorsed the messenger before him and given glad tidings about the next prophet to come, who presented a more complete version of the religion in accordance with man's capacity at the time. This trend continued until the last messenger of God who presented the perfection of an all-inclusive religion. Nimrod countered Hazrat Abraham, Pharaoh countered Hazrat Moses, and the greedy countered Hazrat Jesus Christ and Hazrat Muhammad, may peace be upon all our prophets. And he said that Islam believes that, you know, Abraham was a great prophet, Moses was a great prophet, and then there was Jesus, and then there was Muhammad and the Muslims nodding her head, so I must be getting this right. And basically what, they, what, what Ahmadinejad said was that each of those men brought more truth than the one who came before, as man was ready for it. They brought more illumination and more details and more truth, okay? He said in the future, another prophet will come that will even be greater than Muhammad and will bring the next level of illumination. So Islam is looking for a messianic figure to come. And so they are waiting for the Imam Mahdi. Oh God, hasten the arrival of Imam al-Mahdi and grant him good health and victory and make us his followers and those who attest to his rightfulness. The Buddhists are looking for, you know, the fifth Buddha to come. or whatever. You know, those that are in Tibet that, that, that follow the Dalai Lama, they believe that the Dalai Lama keeps being reincarnated into another person, that spirit of the Dalai Lama. Uh, they will believe that the Antichrist is the new embodiment of the Dalai Lama. The Muslims will look at him as the Imam Mahdi. The Christians will look at him as the second coming of Christ. The Jews will look at him as the Messiah. You know, all of these major religions will all rally around it. And people will say, isn't this great how we're all uniting finally? We're putting aside our differences. And this man is so wonderful. And they will worship this man. This imposter, this antichrist is going to come. The world government will put him into power, give him all the power. And they will also declare him to be God. They'll declare him to be the second coming of Christ. He will basically be killed, the Bible says. He'll receive a deadly wound to his head and he'll actually, his deadly wound will be healed and he will come back to life. And then he's going to basically be proclaimed as the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's gonna be proclaimed as God in the flesh. And all the, the nations of the world, all the peoples of the world are gonna worship this guy. Basically every religion is gonna accept him as their Messiah. But the Bible says that those that are saved will not be deceived by him, but that 
the rest of the world will worship him and, and believe because he's going to perform miracles, the Bible says. And he's going to do all these signs and wonders and he's going to bring uh, in this, this world government. Sometimes you'll try to warn people about a one world government. You'll try to warn them about some of the trends that we see happening of going to a cashless society. There are so many Christians who, when you talk to Christians about a one world government or when you talk to them about a, you know, a cashless society and all these different checkpoints that are being set up and the, the police state, you know, they call you a conspiracy theorist. And I'm sure you've been called a conspiracy theorist through the years. But can, can someone really be a Bible believing Christian and deny that there's going to be a one world government someday? I don't think you can read the Bible. Uh, without seeing the fact that it's always been Satan's plan to rule the world, like being in the brain, and he wants a one world government. He wants to be God. When this man is ruling the entire world, basically he will command that everyone receive what's called the mark of the beast. Who's ever heard of the mark of the beast? And the mark of the beast is going to be something, the Bible says, in your right hand or in your forehead, and that no one will be able to buy or sell without having this mark. Now, people might have read this a few hundred years ago and said, you know, how can you do that? How can you make people not be able to buy or sell unless they have this mark? Can't we just pull out cash? Look, think about the way the technology is. This money that I hold in my hand, this Federal Reserve note, it's a piece of paper. It's worthless. It does not have any intrinsic value. When you see a cashless society starting to develop, more and more we're getting away from using cash. There will be a time when physical money is just going to cease to exist. So is paper money a relic of a bygone era? 95% of the transactions in America or more are now have nothing to do with physical pieces of paper or coins. Have you ever wondered if one day cold, hard cash will simply cease to exist? It's a reality that some say that we should accept. Greenbacks and coins have become an inconvenience. The principle is that we have to move this economy from a cash-based economy to a cashless economy. This involves the banks, it involves the telecoms companies, it involves providers of ATMs and POSs, it involves a cultural change. Just what do you call money these days? Is it a handful of coins and notes? Or are cards taking over? And are some forms of money coming to the end of their lives, like the check? Suppose every store in your town said, hey, we're not taking cash anymore. Well, suppose they said, hey, we're not even going to take, take checks or credit cards because there's too much fraud, too many stolen credit cards, too many bounce checks. It has to be electronic transaction. Because let's face it, the paper money is not really worth anything anyway. It's a piece of paper. Might as well be monopoly money. It's not gold. It's not silver. It has no intrinsic value. So first, they've gotten us used to using pieces of paper that are worthless as money. Today, I can exchange that piece of paper for goods and services. But if somebody said tomorrow, that money's not worth anything. It wouldn't be worth anything. Because you remember the Confederate States of America? Remember the Confederate money? People saved up Confederate money in the mattress. Guess what? It wasn't worth anything. So well, they could do that to you too. And just say, well, your paper money's no good. Now it's all just in your account. It's all tied in with your Facebook and your YouTube channel and your Gmail. And it's great because there's no identity theft. You don't have to worry about leaving your wallet at home. You don't have to worry about your credit card being stolen. It's all just completely cashless. We can control the drugs because there won't be any way to have a cash transaction. It's to prevent crime. It's sci-fi technology that's about to enter the chat checkout lane, all in the name of speed and convenience. You'll be able to buy anything from bread to beer if you agree to give the store your ultimate identity. It scares the heck out of me. Once you have your grocery scanned, now what do you do? Touch your index finger to the image reader and you've paid in about three seconds, all with the touch of your fingertips. It's called biometrics, an automated way to recognize you based on your unique biological characteristics. Do not be sold on this because of a convenience. You know, today it's a fingerprint, tomorrow it, a microchip, maybe that ushers in the mark of the beast. Donnie Attaway quit his management job at Quick Trip when the convenience store chain told him he had to swipe his finger to clock in and clock out. And although it may be optional today, you know, who knows about tomorrow. Experts say biometrics are about to pervade every aspect of our economy and daily lives. And you put your finger in there, 
and my name comes up and she's got all my information. And it's that quick? It's very quick. Love it? Love it. People across the world already use biometrics. The U.S. government, the airlines, gas stations, even Walt Disney World uses technology that can read guest blood veins in lieu of carrying day passes. This one world government is going to have so much power that it's going to be able to dictate that no person on this earth will be able to buy or sell without having the mark of the beast. That's interesting. The King James Bible very clearly says that the mark of the beast, this mark that will be required for you to buy or sell, will be located in their right hand or in their forehead. This could be some kind of an implantable chip where in order to buy or sell, you're just going to need to scan this chip. What's going to happen one day is that they will say, this paper money, that $100 in your pocket, it's worthless. You must scan to pay. It's all electronic now. Now you go to the grocery store, you ring up your groceries, and then just And if you don't have a hand, no problem, because we'll put it in your head, because everybody has a head. You know what I mean? And you'll just, you know, you know, check out at the checkout. And so it'll just, all the money will just be electronic format. And it's already going that way. You know, cell phones are starting to have a scanner. So it could be basically, let's say there's an exchange of goods and services between two people, right? Okay, um, that's going to be $10.50. And, and Go ahead and show, give me your right hand so I can just scan it with my smartphone. Okay, now I just took the money from his account. Oh, you just gave my son a piano lesson. Let me get you paid. Think about it now. The smartphone can be used to scan the mark of the beast, okay? And you can't buy or sell without it. In medical news tonight, a chip the size of a grain of rice could save your life. The year is 2017. You're rushed to a hospital, unconscious with no ID or medical history, but thanks to a microchip under your skin, it's all there. Science fiction 20 years ago, but a biometric reality today. I think it is possible to free us completely of our wallets and keys using biometric technology, if that's what people want in 10 years' time. The challenge is to safeguard our privacy in a brave new world. New microchip technology now makes it possible for the emergency room staff to find out about your medical history at the touch of a computer key. So many emergency physicians have to operate blind. We have to make medical decisions not knowing what medicines you take or what allergies you have. Harvard doctor John Halopka says this radio frequency identification chip may solve that problem. He had it implanted in his right upper arm. A scanner reads an identification number. Those 16 digits are then entered into a secure website where his medical history is stored. EMT worker Brian Orsati says the chip could help emergency workers. One of the big things is if you ever have some type of trauma patient where they come in and they're unable to give you their information and or their medical history. Dr. Alamka says the benefits are clear. I'm a rock climber and I believe that if I fall off a cliff and you find me unconscious, the comfort of being able to scan me and figure out who I am outweighs my concern for privacy. The chip is encased in unbreakable glass and is about the size of a grain of rice. The procedure is done with anesthesia and is relatively pain free. It's like putting a knitting needle under your skin. But in this case, he says getting something under your skin is a good thing. It starts like this. Here's his cat. Five years later, we found out she's back. Then somebody says, well, you know, if it's good enough for a cat, Suki, I've got mom and dad at home and dad kind of wanders off sometimes and maybe we could put in a microchip with his medical records in case something ever happens. Sounds good. And then somebody says, mm -hmm. well, if it's good enough for my cat, good enough for grandma and grandpa, mm -hmm. what about my baby? No more Amber Alerts. Never having to worry about that fear of an abducted child. And then we say, well, you know what? Maybe we should have them. And on that chip, we're going to have everything. Credit cards, driver's license. Think about it. Metro card. I'm thinking. No more wallets. Think about this. Your whole, you don't carry keys anymore. So the question I want everybody at home to ask is, is that a good idea? Because that's where we're going next. It's too sci-fi for me, I'm telling you that. It's, it's here. Much. I it's know here. it's here with pets and in a limited basis, but for humans. But your and your child. Yeah, your child. I mean, come on. People in the past might have wondered, how could this be implemented? How do you stop people from buying or selling if they don't have a mark? But we see now the technology developing that would make it very easy for no one to be able to buy or sell without having this mark.
And guess what? Most people only have like seven days of food in their house or 10 days of food in their house. So if you can't buy or sell, you're going to be in a world of hurt. And basically the Bible says there's also going to be a law that says if you won't worship the Antichrist, you'll be killed. Okay, the, you know, it's, he, this guy's great. He's doing a lot of great things. He's bringing people together. Only one catch, get on board or be put to death. When you hear about that, when you look at that, you probably say, well, in that case, I mean, I guess we're all going to die, you know, that, that are believers, I mean, those that believe on Christ. I guess we're all going to be beheaded. And the Bible talks about us being beheaded. We're all going to be beheaded, but here's the thing. If this were allowed to continue, yeah, you're right, all believers would be killed. Because think about it. Look at the technology. Look at the surveillance cameras that are going up everywhere. The satellites. Now, they, now the police are using drones with cameras to fly around and spy on you. Have you seen that? Surveillance drones. You have them, list, now they're installing microphones at street corners where they can listen in to what you're saying. And it's like the, the dystopic novel, 1984. That's where, the way our country is going to where it's a total surveillance society. Used to be you just got on an airplane. Now you gotta be molested by the TSA. Now you gotta go through a naked body scanner. Now you gotta be scanned. You gotta be patted down. You've got to have ID with you at all times. And police are constantly, where's your ID? There are your papers. Your papers are not in order. You know, and that's the country that, are, that we're living in now. And so what I'm saying is that this is going to continue to the point where it's going to be really hard to escape this prison planet. But let me say this. We will not all be killed. Many will be killed. Don't get me wrong. Many Christians will be beheaded and killed for the cause of Christ. But I'll say this. We will not all be killed because this will be cut short. And the Bible says, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, they shall be shortened. And the Bible says that in the midst of this, Jesus Christ will return. Remember, we talked earlier about the second coming of Christ. He will return just when they think they've defeated Christianity, they've got their global government, they've got their one world government with Satan at its head. Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, and that's when the rapture takes place. And that's when he begins to pour out his wrath on this earth. And you can read about it in Revelation. He's going to be turning water into blood. He's going to be scorching the, the trees and grass. He's going to be sending these locusts from hell that are going to be stinging people with tails like scorpions. You know, if you've read the book of Revelation, if you haven't read it, I would strongly recommend it. And don't read the, the NIV. You know, read the King James Version, okay? If you're going to take the time to read it, why don't you read the, the real thing, okay? Accept no imitation. Look at uh, chapter 13, verse 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. So this beast that's described, the Bible says the dragon is the one who gave him his power, and gave him his seat, and gave him his authority. Look at verse 3. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, does forty and two months kind of ring a bell with time and times at half a time? and 1260 days. See how these things all kind of tie in? He says in verse six, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Watch this, verse seven, here's the key. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Now, didn't we see in chapter 12, verse 17, the dragon's goal was to make war with those who believe in Christ and keep the commandments of God. Here he says, it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Watch this, to overcome them. Who's going to win in this war between the saints and the devil on this earth? The devil. He said he's going to make war with the saints and overcome them. According to Revelation 13, the Antichrist's goal is to make war with the saints. So he doesn't want Christians to take the mark of the beast to avoid persecution. He wants every Christian dead. You say, well, that's depressing. Well, just read to the end of the book and you'll see what happens. You know, you'll see who wins in the end, okay?
This is just a temporary setback in chapter 13, okay? But he says in verse 7, It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So this man that's called the beast, this man who has power over all nations, all kindreds, all tongues, his goal is to make war with the saints. And the Bible says that everyone on the earth will worship him. Wait a minute. No, it doesn't. It says everyone on the earth will worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So let me ask you this. Are those whose names in the book of life, are they worshiping him? No. Well, the Bible says he'll be so believable and so smooth that he would deceive the elect if it were possible. But God will not allow any of those that are saved to be deceived by this guy. So everybody who's truly saved, even those who've been sucked into like a pre-trib rapture, when they start seeing it happen, they'll be like, you know, or hopefully when they see this documentary, they'll be like, oh, you know, they'll realize, wait a minute, this is happening. You know, this is the Antichrist. I, I can't take this thing in my hand. I shouldn't worship this guy. This isn't really Christ. So anybody who won't worship him is going to be killed, and anyone who won't worship him can't buy or sell. You're not just going to go to Walgreens and get the mark of the beast. It's not going to be something where you just show up at the post office. Okay, you know, can I get my chip so that I can buy or sell? No, the Bible's clear. You must worship the Antichrist in order to receive this chip. Now, even many decades ago, you had lie detectors. Now they're developing brain scan type technologies. I believe that probably in order to get the mark of the beast, you're going to have to worship the Antichrist and, and pledge allegiance unto the Antichrist, and he'll know if you're telling the truth. Sci-fi is here. Tomorrow is here now. Not only that, but if you think about it, the transportation now is so controlled. There are checkpoints on the highways for, you know, trying to drive. And then if you try to go on an airplane, the TSA is going to put you through a naked body scanner. And so it seems like the control grid is being put in place so that, you know, you're not going to be able to function in society unless you bow down to this uh, beast and worship the beast and receive the mark. That's exactly right. And they're going to, we're going to be villainized. Jesus said very clearly his disciples would be hated for his name's sake. Anybody who doesn't cooperate with this wonderful new world order that they're planning is going to be looked at as the enemy. But you can look at it like, for instance, with school. You go to take your kindergartner to put him in school, and they say, you cannot come to school unless you're vaccinated. Right. Well, what if you have a, an aversion to vaccines and say, hey, I think this may be causing autism. It may be causing a host of things. I don't know, but I don't want to take a chance. And I don't see any scriptural equivalence to vaccinations where you put some poison in your body to you know, be inoculated against more. Right, right. The fact is that the school says you can't come unless you're vaccinated, so now you have a choice. Do you stand by your convictions or do you bow down and, you know, give your kids a vaccine for convenience? It'll be the same with the mark of the beast. It was the same 80 years ago with Social Security number. People had an aversion to having a number. They said, no, I'm a name, you know. And then they slowly got to now where everybody has one and doesn't even think about it. Is that step one, two, or three toward the final goal of a one world kingdom. Satan is cast out of heaven. He knows he has a short time. He goes to make war against the believers and the saints. And what does he do? He does it by putting a man in power, doesn't he? The dragon gave him his power. He puts a man in power over the entire world, over every kindred and every tongue. And this man will carry out the devil's war against the saints. Well, the Bible says in verse 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So here, this, this man is demanding worship, okay? It says in verse 13, he doeth great wonders, wonders or miracles, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. 
and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would now worship the image of the beast should be killed. And you say, what in the world is that image of the beast that is given life? As we get closer and closer to this, I think that we can kind of understand the technology a little more. So I don't really know exactly what kind of an image this is going to be. But it's some kind of an image of the beast that can speak and, and cause that as many as will not worship are killed. Now this kind of reminds me of Daniel chapter 3. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar, who was king over the civilized world at that time, do you remember how he made a great image? And they had to worship that image. And what would happen if they didn't worship the image? They're killed, right? Isn't that similar to what we see here? That's a picture of the Antichrist. Look at verse 16. Here's the key. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six, or 666. This is one of the tools that Satan is using to persecute the believers. The mark of the beast is a tool that he's using to make war with the saints because of the fact that if you can't buy or sell, it's pretty hard to function in today's world, isn't it? Or in any world. So not only does he make a law that says, if you don't worship the Antichrist, you're going to be killed. That's a persecution right there. That's making war with the saints. He also makes it impossible for the saints to buy or sell because they don't have the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast is only going to be given to those who worship the beast. And so those that are saved, those that are the saints, they're not going to worship the beast. The Bible's clear on that in Matthew 24 and elsewhere. So they're not going to be able to buy or sell. And they're going to have a death warrant on them. Now imagine yourself right now in a world, and I didn't say in a nation, I didn't say in a country, I said in a world where you can't buy or sell and where there's a warrant out for you to be put to death. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to survive in a world like that? Not only that, what about all the surveillance cameras that are going in? What about the license plate reading cameras? What about the naked body scanners? What about the showing your ID at checkpoints? Showing your ID to get on a train? Showing your ID to get on an airplane? And you know what? Pretty soon you're going to have to show something else. Okay, let's see your right hand. Okay, you're good to go. Have a nice day. This is not far-fetched at all. Maybe when people read this a few hundred years ago, they didn't look at it the same way as we look at it. When we look at it, it has a little bit of flesh on it, doesn't it? Because we are already seeing That's why I think that this may be close. I don't know. Christians today are not ready for this at all. They're not ready for it at all. You know what you need to do? You need to prepare yourself spiritually and be ready so that you're like, oh, what's happening? Oh. You know, you need to be ready. You need to be prepared. That's why God warns us and warns us and warns us and warns us. That's why Paul even warned the people of his day. Obviously, they weren't living in the days of the Great Tribulation, but they went through their own tribulations like every believer does. He said, we warned you. Verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, as you know. And so we need to be warned and to understand that this is coming so that we can handle it. Christians today are not being warned about the events they will face in the Great Tribulation. Instead, pastors across America are teaching their people that the rapture will take place before the Antichrist carries out his war with the saints and that the rapture will be the very first event on God's prophetic timeline. This doctrine, known as eminence, teaches that Christ may return in the clouds at any moment and that there will be no signs of his coming. However, the Bible teaches that Christ's coming is not imminent and that there are other events that must take place first. You've probably heard this doctrine that says that, you know, Jesus could come today. You know, who's heard that before? Who's heard that taught? And it's what's called the imminent return of Christ. They believe that Jesus is coming back at any moment. You see, I've asked people many times when they tell me Jesus can come at any moment, I, I ask them, where does it say that in the Bible? And what they inevitably come back at me with is, well, the Bible says, no man knoweth the day or the hour of his coming. 
And a lot of times they just can't show you and you have to help them, you know, find it for them. And he said, well, I don't have it in front of me. I don't know the exact chapter, but I know that Jesus said that no man knoweth the day or the hour. I said, let me help you. He said it in Matthew 24, 36. Let me read for you what the Bible says, because I want to show you how unbiblical this is, because this is mainstream Christianity. I mean, if you went down to the Christian bookstore right now, they would have all kinds of books and videos. And who's ever heard of this film, Left Behind? Complete fairy tale, nothing to do with the Bible, completely unbiblical. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my father only. So people will take that verse and say, see right there, no man knoweth the day or the hour. That means it can happen at any moment. But notice he said, but of that day, no man knoweth the day or the hour. So the question is, which day? Well, it's the day that he just finished talking about. And here's the thing, back in verse 29, he said, that that day is after the tribulation. He said in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation, he describes the events that are going to happen. Then he says, of that day and hour knoweth no man. So we don't know the day or the hour, but one thing we do know is that it's after the tribulation. People who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, they do these mental gymnastics <laughs> where they'll, you'll try to show them, see, it says right there, after the tribulation, this is what there's a, that's not about the rapture. That's not the rapture. You say, well, how do you know? Well, because it's after the tribulation. And of course we know that the rapture is before the tribulation. But then you'll ask him, well, where does the Bible say that the rapture can happen any moment? Well, right there it says, no man knoweth the day or the hour. You just said this wasn't about the rapture. So when it says it's after the tribulation, Matthew 24 is not about the rapture. But when it says that no man knoweth the day or the hour, now all of a sudden Matthew 24 is about the rapture again. And when it says, you know, two are in the field, one taken and the other left, well, that's about the rapture again. Just shut up and do what you're told. Just shut up and believe in the pre-trib rapture because I said so. You say, give both sides. Be fair, give both sides. Okay, here's the other side. Shut up and believe what I told you to say. Quit asking questions. Shut up and believe it because I said so. That's the pre-trib side. I mean, it's true. They've got nothing. I've got scripture after scripture after scripture and they got a whole lot of nothing. At least other false doctrines are based on some kind of a Bible verse that they're twisting and, and people will take a Bible verse, take it out of context, twist it. The pre-tribulation rapture is not even twisting any scripture. They don't even have a scripture. There is no scripture that says anything about the rapture taking place before the tribulation. It's just a doctrine that's not based on scripture whatsoever. It's based on tradition. It's based on a book or a chart that somebody read. It's not based on the Bible. It didn't come from the Bible. It doesn't have its origins in the Bible. I find that whenever I explain this to people who are in the pew, they have no problem understanding this doctrine. It's the people in the pulpit who will not face this doctrine. And I'll tell you why. The pre-trib rapture is the popular doctrine. If you want to be popular, you're going to preach the pre-trib rapture. You start preaching that the rapture comes after the tribulation and you're going to be ostracized. You're going to be blackballed you're going to be rejected from fellowship because they do not want to change on this doctrine. Because there are people out there who have an agenda of making sure that nobody hears the truth on this doctrine. It's true. And the way that they keep this doctrine in the dark is, is through fear and intimidation. Because I talk to pastors all the time. I show them the truth on this. They agree with me, but they will not go into their pulpit and preach on this doctrine because they are afraid of all their pastor friends turning on them. They're not going to have the speaking engagements. They're not going to be able to preach in these churches because you've got to be pre-trib to be in the club. And if you're not pre-trib, you're not in the club. Many times they won't accept it because they don't want to eat crow because they've been preaching it wrong all these years. They don't want to admit that. They don't want to admit that their Bible college taught them wrong. They don't want to admit that they made a mistake. Now, everybody makes mistakes. We all grow. We all learn new things. and. You know, if you're wrong on something, you got you to be corrected on it. So the Bible says in Galatians 1.10, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And these preachers need to decide whether pleasing men is more important by preaching what's popular, preaching the preacher of rapture, because that's what everybody wants to hear, because they like the movie and they have the video game and the board game and the DVD or go with what the Bible actually says and get up and preach that the rapture comes after the tribulation 
it's a perfect example of people taking what man says over what God says. It's just a classic example of not making the Bible your final authority and just going with tradition, going with what you've been taught, going with what people are saying, going with the flow, instead of going with what the Bible says. You know, I used to believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. It's what I was taught since I was a child, and you know, you just never really question what you're told. But when I was exposed to the truth and I began to see the scriptures and what the Bible actually taught, you know, I had to personally make a choice whether I was just going to go along to get along, whether I was just going to go with the flow, or if I was going to take a stand for what I believe and take a stand for what I knew was true. And you know, just in my personal life, I've been attacked and I've had people uh, talk bad about me because of my stand on the pre-tribulation rapture. But I would hope that maybe if you're listening to this or you're watching this or you start to see the truth in regards to this, that you would just step out by faith and you would uh, take the stand and maybe help us be able to turn the tide against this unscriptural doctrine that is the pre-tribulation rapture. Another key verse that got me was 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. Verses 1 through 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, so he's referring to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, and by our gathering together unto him, a reference to the rapture, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ, again referring to the rapture, is at hand. He says, look, it's not at hand. It's not the next event that's going to happen. He says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, talking about the day that we'll be gathered together, shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So there it's proven in scripture that the day of our gathering together with the Lord Jesus Christ shall not come till there's a falling away and the man of sin be revealed. The only thing that's imminent is the fact that the Antichrist is coming. So the Bible flat out tells us that the day of Christ is not at hand. And he said, if anybody tries to tell you that the day of Christ is at hand, he said, that person's lying to you. That person is a deceiver. He said, don't be deceived by a word or by a spirit or even by a letter as from us, a letter claiming to be from us, saying that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. That day shall not come except X, Y, and Z happen first. The rapture simply cannot happen at any moment. The tribulation has to happen first. The antichrist has to come into power first. The sun and moon are gonna be darkened before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. The Bible's real clear. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. The antichrist will be revealed. The antichrist will sit in the temple of God and declare himself to be God. The Antichrist will be in power before the rapture happens. It's that simple. But if you look at Luke 17, Luke 17 actually chronologically comes before Matthew 24 because Matthew 24 is a parallel passage with Luke 21. So in Luke 17, we read about the first recorded incident of Jesus teaching his disciples about this doctrine. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now, a lot of people will take this and say that that means that, you know, people are going to be just as wicked as they were in the days of Noah. Also, he says, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And people will say, yes, it'll be just as wicked as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And they'll point at uh, all the things that are going on in our society that would mirror what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And they'll say it was just as wicked as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah, or it's going to be just as wicked as it was in Noah's day. But really, that's not the comparison that Jesus is making. In verse 28, he says, Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And what we learn from this passage is the fact that, you know, when Lot was brought out of Sodom, really that's a picture of the rapture. You find two angels going into Sodom, which represents the world, and bringing the believer out before the wrath of God is poured out on the city. And the book of Revelation teaches the same thing. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ sends his angels, gathers the believers, brings them out of the world. And the book of Revelation specifically it tells us that a half hour goes by and then he begins to pour out his wrath. This left behind model where everybody disappears and everybody's saying, where are they all? That's not what people are going to be saying because the Bible says that the same day that we're going to be taken, God's going to begin to pour out judgment. God's going to begin to rain fire and brimstone on this earth. People are going to know 
that something's happening. People are going to be running for cover. People are going to be asking the rocks to fall on them and to hide them because of the fire, the brimstone, the wrath that's going to be coming. The same day that we're taken out of here is the same day that God's going to begin to pour out his wrath. That's why when the sun and moon are darkened, the Bible says the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Because that same day, a half hour later, God begins to rain fire and brimstone. So chapter six of Revelation, the sun and moon are darkened. Chapter seven, the great multitude of believers appears in heaven. Chapter eight, he begins to pour out his wrath. It's exactly what the Bible teaches in Matthew 24. Sun and moon darken, then the rapture. It's that simple. I talk to people who believe in the preacher rapture and they'll usually tell me either one of two things. They'll either tell me that the rapture is not even mentioned in the book of Revelation, which is a pretty strange thing to say since the book of Revelation covers in such great detail the events of the end times. To leave out an event as significant as Jesus Christ coming in the clouds and all the believers of all the ages being caught up together with him in the clouds, that's such a major event. To say that it's not mentioned at all in the book of Revelation, that it doesn't happen at all in the book of Revelation, is, is unthinkable. But because it's so ridiculous to say that the rapture is not found in the book of Revelation at all, a lot of pre-trib people have tried to search for it and find something that they could use as the rapture that's before the tribulation. And here's what I keep hearing over and over again, Revelation 4.1. And Revelation 4.1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So this is a voice like a trumpet. There's no trumpet in this verse that's speaking and saying to John, singular, one person, come up hither and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. And they'll say, see, that's the rapture right there. One guy being caught up, they say, that's the rapture. What's ridiculous about this is that they don't even read verse two. Because in verse number two, it says, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven. Now the rapture is not a spirit going up into heaven. The rapture is a bodily resurrection. We're gonna be caught up physically into the air. This isn't just some kind of a thing where our spirit goes up. No, the Bible's clear that the rapture is a literal bodily resurrection of the dead in Christ, which shall rise first. We which are alive and remain are gonna be caught up together with him bodily. And so this spiritual catching up of one person, John, is definitely not the rapture. And if you think that this is the rapture, you're taking a really loose interpretation. And it's funny because people I talk to who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, they claim to interpret the Bible literally. Yet when you ask them to show you the rapture in Revelation, they'll take you to Revelation 4.1. One guy being taken up to heaven, they don't even read to verse 2 when he says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. He didn't even physically go up. His body was still there on the Isle of Patmos. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. This isn't just some kind of a spiritual occurrence. This is a physical occurrence. And so, I mean, that's quite a stretch, you know, to say that that's the rapture. But, that, you know, those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, they have to say that Revelation 4 one's the rapture because that's the only thing that they can even find in the book of Revelation before the tribulation. And it just doesn't fit. I mean, they just, they had to find something, I guess. I grew up being taught the pre-tribulation rapture. And when I was growing up, I was taught that it's never mentioned in the book of Revelation, which I always thought that there was something fishy about that. Because an event as important and as major as the rapture, you got a book about end times prophecy, the book of Revelation, and he just doesn't mention it. Doesn't make any sense. And you know, I, I was always taught as a kid that the rapture would be where you're just going about your life and all of a sudden you just disappear. But it's so much greater than that because the Bible says every eye shall see him. And we're going to see the sun and moon darkened. And it says in Luke 21 that when you see these things begin to come to pass, he said, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. So just imagine what it's going to be like at that moment when the sun goes dark, the moon goes dark, the stars begin to fall and we look up just knowing this is it, it's here, we made it. It's sort of like a Hollywood entrance. If you ever watch the famous people come into any place, you know, they always have the lights flash and the cannons boom and you know, the smoke and everything else. Right. They want to impress people, hey, look at me, okay? 
if, if you read Revelation chapter 6, or Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, any of the passages that describe the sun and the moon going dark, it's really amazing when you look at it. The sun and the moon go dark, which is going to get just about everybody's attention on Earth. But it also says there's an earthquake. So in case you're blind, it is still going to get your attention. And then at that moment of total darkness, Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, lights up the whole sky. The Bible says he'll light up the sky like the lightning where it shines from one end of heaven to the other. And we'll look up and we'll see Jesus Christ coming in the clouds and we'll know at any moment we're about to be caught up to be with him. Man, I hope that I live to see that day. I don't, I don't know if this is gonna happen in our lifetime, but I hope that this happens in my lifetime. I hope I can endure that persecution and tribulation and what an awesome thing it will be to be alive on that day when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds. It's so much greater than we've been led to believe. The idea that there's going to be a secret second coming where you know people have to later find out what happened, it's just not true. Everybody's going to get everybody's attention with this grand Hollywood opening. Yeah, you're exactly right. And in Revelation chapter 1, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And, and notice the cometh is in present tense. I mean, that's, that's the next time he comes. He's coming with clouds, and every eye shall see him. So it's pretty clear. Now, to the unsaved, this is going to scare them to death. I mean, the Bible says that when they see him coming in the clouds, they're going to be mourning, they're going to be weeping, they're going to be scared to death. But for those of us that look for his appearing, we're going to be excited, we're going to be thrilled. And it's going to be an amazing feeling to know this is it. You know, I personally want this film to be successful, and I would love this film to be able to be used of God to open people's eyes to the truth, because I just think it's so important if we can get back to the Bible. You know, I, I remember, I, as I was a teenager and I was growing up, I, I didn't even like reading the book of Revelation just because I thought I couldn't understand it or every time I was reading something, I questioned whether does it actually say that or does it actually mean that. And when I was able to learn the truth about the rapture, you know, it just opened up the scriptures to me. Now, I love reading the book of Revelation. Now, I, as I go through it, it just makes so much sense. And I, I just think that if we can uh, reach out to the uh, movement of Christianity out there, to the movement of fundamentalism, to the movement of, of Baptists out there, and we could open their eyes to, to this issue, then maybe it would bring a love of the Word of God and a revival of the Word of God and a revival of studying the Word of God back to the pulpits of our country, and we could really see a great work done for God. The reason that we made this film is not to split doctrinal hairs or just to correct someone whose view of Bible prophecy is a little bit different than ours. That's not the point. These events are real events that will take place. The Bible tells us there will be a one world government. There will be a one world religion. There will be a one world currency. This isn't just a conspiracy theory that people can brush off. These events are really going to happen. People are going to be killed in mass numbers. There's going to be famine. There's going to be pestilence. There's going to be persecution. It's going to be unlike anything that this world has ever been through, and Christians are not prepared for it at all because they've believed in this fairy tale of the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I believe in the rapture. It's a biblical doctrine, but the rapture comes after the tribulation. You say, Pastor Jimenez, why does this matter? Well, here's why it matters. The pre-tribulation rapture is a doctrine that I believe it doesn't really much matter what we do. Because no matter what, look, e either I'm going to die in peace as an old man, or I'm just going to be going through life, taking my vacations, investing in my 401k, living the good life, and one day I'm just going to disappear before anything bad happens. And see, this teaching being taught to millions of people I believe has caused us to become very lazy and very satisfied in our Christianity. We need to preach the gospel. We need to get out, out there. And, and, and we have to educate people and tell them, look, there's persecution coming. You know, go on your little vacation and do all the things you got to do, but you better strengthen your inner man. You better get in your Bible. You better start learning the Bible. You better start, uh, you know, walking with God and knowing God. You better start reading the Bible because there might be a day when they take this Bible away from you. And there might come a day, you, you know, today we're given complete freedom to gather together, to open the Bible, to preach the word. But there might come a day when this assembly would be illegal. 
When, when this Bible would be illegal. When doing what we're doing right now would be illegal. And if we would have a heart for God, we would reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so all that to say this. These things have I preached unto you that you might not be offended when persecution comes. When you're asked to take the mark of the beast in your right hand or in your forehead, you'll remember this sermon. Maybe it won't happen in our lifetime. Maybe it will. But if it does, you'll remember this sermon. That's why Jesus said it, and that's why I'm saying it. You say, is this to scare us? Are we? No. The Bible says, in the world you shall have tribulation. Get upset about it? No. He said, in the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Cheer up. Don't, don't be down. Don't walk out of the sermon, oh, man, are you serious? Beheadings? Prison? Famine? Pestilence? Are you serious? No. Be of good cheer. He's overcome the world. Maybe it'll happen in our lifetime, maybe it won't. But either way, you know what? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Praise Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the clear truth in your word. And we thank you so much for uh, giving us the Holy Spirit to guide us. I couldn't have figured this stuff out on my own with all the brainwashing I received from these people lying to me and, and Schofield and all this stuff. But thank you for the Holy Spirit that just in that room so many years ago, just cut through all that and just burned these three words into my mind. These three words just burned into my mind from Matthew 24 as a 12-year-old boy after the tribulation. And I pray that those words would sink into the hearts and minds of every person who's here tonight. We love you and thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's sing one quick song before we go. Uh, you know, it's my, I don't know if you might not know, it's my favorite song. And we're going to sing my favorite verse right now. And a lot of times when you're singing songs, you know, you just start singing. You don't really think about the words and what it's saying. But just look at what the, ver the third verse of the song says. It says, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious time. You think, well, what's the bliss about thinking about my sin? But look at what it says. It says, it's nailed to the cross. Yeah. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord of my soul. So just think about those words as you're singing it and sing it out. And we'll get ready for this preaching. My sin.
No, the Bible's really clear on salvation. It's not based on how good you are. A lot of people think they're pretty good, you know, and yeah, they're going to get to heaven because they're pretty good. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous, you're not righteous. And if it were our goodness that would get us into heaven, none of us would be going. Because the Bible even says in Revelation 21, 8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters, and listen to this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've lied before. Everybody's lied before. So we've all sinned, and we've done stuff worse than lying, let's face it. We all deserve hell. But the Bible says, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus Christ, because he loves us, came to this earth. The Bible says he was God manifest in the flesh. God basically took on human form. He lived a sinless life. He did not commit any sin. And, of course, they beat him and spit on him and, and nailed him to the cross. The Bible says that when he was on that cross, he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So every sin you've ever done, every sin I've ever done, it was as if Jesus had done it. He was being punished for our sins. And then, of course, they took his body when he died. They took his body and buried it in the tomb. And his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights, Acts 2.31. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He showed unto the disciples the holes in his hands. And the Bible's really clear that Jesus did die for everybody. It says that he died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But there's something that we must do to be saved. The Bible says, it has that question in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's it. He didn't say join a church and you'll be saved, get baptized and you'll be saved, live a good life and you'll be saved, repent of all your sins and you'll be saved. No, he said believe. And even the most famous verse in the whole Bible that's written on the bottom, I mean, the, the reference is written on the bottom of the cup at In-N-Out Burger. I mean, it's so famous. Everybody's heard of it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting means everlasting. It means forever. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So if you believe on Jesus Christ, the Bible says you have everlasting life. You're going to live forever. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Once you're saved, once you believe on him, you're saved forever. And no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Even if I were to go out and commit some awful sin, God will punish me for it on this earth. If I went out and killed somebody today, you know, God's going to make sure I get punished. I'm going to prison or, or far worse or the death penalty. Whatever this earth punishes me and God's going to make sure I get punished even more. But I'm not going to hell. There's nothing I can do to go to hell because I'm saved. And if I went to hell, God lied because he promised that whoever believeth in him has everlasting life. And he said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's why there are a lot of examples of people in the Bible who did some really bad stuff, yet they made it to heaven. How? Because they were so good? No, it's because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sins are forgiven. Other people who may have lived a better life in the world's eyes, or maybe even really they lived a better life, they don't believe in Christ. They're going to have to go to hell to be punished for their sins. And let me just close on this one thought. One thing that I wanted to be sure and bring up today is that there was a question that was asked to Jesus by one of his disciples. And that question was this, are there few that be saved? That's a good question, right? I mean, are most people saved? Or is it few that are saved? Now, who here thinks that most people are going to heaven? Most people in this world are going to heaven. Yeah, guess what the answer was? He said, in Matthew 7, for example, he said, enter ye in at the straight gate. He said, because wide is the gate and broad is the way that lead it to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he went on to say this. He said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, 
Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you see, there are people out there. First of all, the majority of this world doesn't even claim to believe in Jesus. Thankfully, the majority of this classroom claims to believe in Jesus. Okay, But the majority of the world does not claim to believe in Jesus. But God warned that even amongst those who claim to believe in Jesus, even amongst those that call him Lord, many will be saying to him, what if all our, we did all these wonderful works. Why aren't we saved? He's going to say, depart from me. I never you. That's, why, that's because salvation is not by works. And if you're trusting your own works to save you, if you think you're going to heaven because you've been baptized, or if you think you, well, I think you have to live a good life. I think you have to keep the commandments to be saved. I think you have to go to church. I think you got to, you know, turn from your sins. You know, if you're trusting in your works, Jesus is going to say to you one day, depart from me. I never knew you. You have to have all your faith in what he did. You have to put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross when he died for you, he's buried and rose again. That's your ticket into heaven. If you're trusting all the things, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good Christian and I do all these wonderful things. He's going to say, depart from me. And notice what he said. Depart from me, I never knew you. Not I used to know you. Because once he knows you, remember I mentioned this earlier, it's everlasting, it's eternal. Once he knows you, you're saved forever. But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because if you go to hell, it's because he never knew you. Because once he knows you, he knows you. It's just like my children will always be my children. You know, when you're born again, when you're his child, you'll always be his child. You may be the black sheep of the family. You know, you may be uh, somebody who gets disciplined by God heavily on this earth. You can screw up your life down here, but you can't screw that up. You know, you're saved. It's a done deal. And so that's the main thing that I wanted to present to you about the end times. And we do have just a few minutes for uh, questions about either uh, salvation or about the end times.